So this is, uh, I'm, I'm Case Cook, it's the Dutch spelling, but um, it's just pronounced Case. Uh, this is about the Linux kernel self-protection project and sort of an update uh, and background. Um, so um, a, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, uh, while specific to Linux kernel, um, does sort of relate to the larger uh, software ecosystem, um, but my focus is just Linux kernel. Uh, for this. Um, so specifically when I say kernel security, um, I'm, I'm talking about things more than access control like, like SE Linux, uh, more than attack surface reduction uh, like SecComp, uh, more than just uh, fixing bugs, uh, and more than protecting user space. Um, the kernel supports all kinds of things for protecting user space from being attacked by user space. Um, this is more than kernel integrity, which tend, you know, like integrity measurement and static roots of trust and things like that. This is about kernel self-protection or protecting the kernel from user space attacks. Uh, and uh, I care about this because Linux is used in like two billion Android devices uh, as of this year. Um, the terrifying number that I don't like is that the vast majority of these are running the 3.4 kernel. Um, two billion is a long tail of devices out there. Um, 3.10 is slowly catching up, and uh, we only released a 3.18 kernel device, new device, this year, so we'll catch up eventually. Um, but the main point is that bug lifetimes uh, in these devices result in, in, they're much longer than the bug lifetimes even in the upstream kernel, uh, and that's, that is an actual problem we should try to find a way to solve. Um, and when I talk about uh, upstream bug lifetime, I can get into some statistics. Um, John Corbett uh, looked at this in 2010 and sort of tracked down a bunch of known flaws to figure out when they were introduced and when they got fixed and came up with an average of about five years. Um, I've been doing this for a couple of years now with the Ubuntu CVE tracker, which also has the uh, when a flaw was introduced and when it was fixed. Uh, my average is starting to creep up above five years now. Um, and most of this is because a lot of this research sort of stops at the beginning of Git history. And that's more than five years ago. <laughs> uh, so we're, this is slowly growing. Um, so this is an insane eye chart. Uh, this is kernel releases on one side. The top is 4.13. The bottom is the beginning of Git history. Uh, the black line is about where uh, the database of CVEs I was working on started, started tracking. Uh, so while there were CVEs in earlier stuff, they were found after that line in time. Um, these are sort of the priority of the, of the flaw. So low is black, medium is blue, Orange is high and red, which you can barely see, is critical. I'm going to zoom in on those in a second. Um, and the, the height of these lines is the life of a given bug. So if it's at the very bottom, it was introduced before Git history. And then at the top of the line is basically where it was fixed. So the lifetime of a flaw um, is represented in that height of the line. And this is uh, a, more than 800 CVEs that, are, uh, that this is looking at. Um, really, I only care about high and critical stuff, but that's still more than 60. Um, and you see the span for how long uh, things were, when they were introduced and when they got fixed. Um, and uh, the point really here is that uh, everyone here has a bunch of high and critical flaws in the kernel you're running, like right now. We just don't know what they are. Um, but we'll find them eventually. Um, and a lot of people have, have sort of said, well, nobody knows about the flaw, so it doesn't matter that it got introduced two years ago and we've all been running with this for uh, years on end. Um, but that's not actually true because there are people looking for these flaws. Um, and every once in a while we get a view into that when they decide that they want to boast about it. Um, you can see an example of this from 2010 where they talk about they started using a, a zero-day flaw the day it got introduced, and they used it for two years until it got fixed in 2010. Um, so it's possible not all the bugs have been found by 
by bad actors uh, before it got found by the public. Um, but we sort of have to believe that at least some of them have been. Um, so fighting bugs. Uh, we're absolutely finding them. Um, we're, we've got tons of static checkers. We've got tons of dynamic checkers. Um, we're fixing them normally. Uh, when I give versions of this talk, I, I can't actually point to Greg and say you should ask Greg. But um, so I've I got statistics of this, uh, although Greg covered this pretty well uh, yesterday. So uh, as of the 4949 stable release, there were 3,593 patches, which is about 73 bug fixes per stable release at that time, which is big. And Greg is nodding his head. Um, so. We're definitely doing a good job finding bugs, but we're going to keep writing them. Um, they exist whether or not we're aware of them. Uh, and ultimately, just fighting bugs isn't enough. Uh, so we need to keep going. Uh, I was inspired by Greg's quote uh, yesterday. I felt, um, I felt like what I would have wanted to say in that state was just, your machine is insecure. Um, but I think that's a little bit alarmist and, and a little bit uh, unsubtle. Um, so I think my, my version of this might be, if you're not using the latest kernel, you don't have the most recently added security defenses, which in the face of newly exploited bugs may render your machine less secure than it could have been. But that's really not very pithy. Um, and I'll get into more, more of this as we go on. Uh, so getting into that, uh, there was a fantastic analogy uh, done by Constantine, uh, who, who uh, presented last year. Um, but he did this at the 2015 Linux Security Summit, um, where he compared the entire software industry, um, although it applies again to Linux kernel, to like the US car industry in the 1960s. Um, and his wonderful way of putting it was, you know, the, the car industry was saying, you're driving down the road, and you're not getting sprayed in the face with oil and gas, and you can go really fast. It's wonderful how great these cars run. Um, and then if you you know, lose a wheel, you crash on the side and everything bursts into flames and everyone dies. Uh, so they weren't designed to fail, but they are very good at running. Um, and we've got to sort of shift our mindset and deal with failure, deal with attack and expect attack and expect that there are bugs, so we have to design the system in a way that makes it uh, more defensive. Um, so I want to get the Linux kernel caught up in this regard, um, sort of like this comparison here of the, these, these two cars doing a head-on collision is a, uh, a 1959 Bel Air, uh, which is on the left, and a 2009 Chevy Malibu. So roughly similar models of vehicle, but 50 years apart. And the, the 59 car, the entire front uh, cab has been crushed down into nothing, and the, the main cab of the 2009 is okay. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of like to get the kernel out of the Bel Air and into the Malibu. Um, so uh, as gets talked about, um, there is certainly some truth in the fact that uh, security bugs are just bugs. Um, you know, your security bug may not be my security bug. There may be, you know, how you're running your system, what you're, you know, there's a lot of variety to that. Uh, and we're not sure necessarily what bugs attackers might end up using at a given moment. Um, and it's certainly nice to kill the bugs, uh, but there's a lot of out-of-tree code that the upstream kernel can't control necessarily. Um, and that tends to get used a lot as sort of a, as an excuse to ignore this problem. Um, some, you know, there has been a, a, a cultural attitude in the upstream kernel that, oh, well, the, you know, two million lines of code that are uh, in, in some Android device, we can't control that, so it's not our problem, et cetera. But, the base of the Linux kernel is still on that phone. We can create infrastructure uh, to, to help the situation. So it'd be nicer to just kill entire bug classes instead of killing individual bugs. Um, if we can stop the entire thing, you know, an entire bug from, ha an entire class of bug from happening, uh, we should do that. Um, much like killing individual bugs, we will also never kill all classes of bugs. But if we can shift our attention to killing bug classes, uh, we'll be much more effective at killing uh, bugs overall. Um, even better is killing exploitation methods. Um, the infrastructure in the kernel is designed, you know, sort of like the car running to run and do what it needs to do. Uh, 
we can make changes to the internal and the layout of the kernel. We can change things in how the kernel does its job to make it less uh, hospitable to an attacker. Um, one issue of this, again related to the car analogy, is that sometimes these defenses, these changes to the kernel, do in fact make it more difficult uh, for us to continue developing the kernel. Um, example, again, uh, out of the cars is, you know, so we have to design the front crumple zone or something or other of the car, and now the person who wants to design the exterior appearance of the car has all of these limitations on what they can do and how big something has to be or how small or whatever, and they're bounded by the safety concerns. Um, but my goal is to try to try to say that this is okay. Like we have to get to the point where accepting that uh, that additional work uh, is necessary for uh, providing for our end users. We don't just want it to run well; we want it to be safe for them to use. Um, so. It's worth mentioning, of course, that uh, it's rare to have a single bug result uh, in, in a full-blown exploit. Um, that's another piece of thinking that um, is a bit out of, out of date. So uh, attacks tend to be built up of a series of bugs and information leaks and uh, breaking this chain of exploitation uh, is another way of thinking about how to get things done. Um, there has been pushback in the past on, you know, oh, we need to change this piece of infrastructure or change how something is, is built in the kernel. And there's pushback that says, well, but that's silly. There's, that's not actually a problem. You say, well, it can be a problem if these things happen first and these other things happen later. It's like, okay, well, we have to, we have to deal with the middle of that chain and, and see if we can still break it. Um, so just because there isn't a way to get at this thing we're trying to fix right now, uh, there may be in the future, so we want to fix it uh, as well. Um, so what can we do? Uh, a lot of these defenses already exist in the world. Um, they've been in uh, a lot of out of tree uh, patches like GR security and PACs, um, or they've been researched and in academic papers that don't provide an implementation. Um, but a lot of stuff hadn't been traditionally in the upstream uh, kernel. And finally, there's kind of been a growing demand for getting these protections in the kernel. Uh, the Washington Post had an article near the end of 2015 sort of getting into this as, you know, they presented as the Linux kernel is sort of falling behind with these, with modern defenses. Um, so around then I knew it was time to really try to make a push to, to make things better. Um, but quickly I want to talk about out of tree defenses. Uh, everything is a fork of upstream. If you run a distro, you're running a forked kernel. Um, so effectively, everyone is using some form of, of a, an out-of-tree uh, kernel. And these, the defenses are in a variety of different states uh, in various forks. Um, for example, uh, Red Hat had a, a series, uh, the exec shield series of stuff. Those got knacked in upstream. That's why they're not in upstream. Uh, Ubuntu sort of uses their kernel as a staging ground for developing stuff, uh, app armor, uh, tends to go into upstream after it's stabilized in Ubuntu for a little while. Um, there's sometimes hardware specific or, or sort of vendor differentiation defenses. Uh, an example would be the Samsung Knox patches uh, for Android. And then, you know, the, the pioneers of Linux kernel defense uh, has been GR Security, which has been in a giant patch uh, with lots and lots of stuff. Uh, and those have been traditionally too complex for anyone to, to upstream. Um, there is also a difference in the audience, like the, who is actually using the kernel. Uh, if all you need to do is boot existing standard hardware and run your business, you really don't care what fork you're using. And this is how this already works. You can run a distro kernel, you can run GR security, you can do whatever you want because you're not developing the kernel. If you're in the situation where you're actually developing a kernel, it makes it much harder to integrate multiple forks. You can't have you know, the two million lines of Android vendor code plus uh, another giant patch. Most, uh, most kernel engineering groups won't accept the additional work, and won't accept the risk um, of those kinds of things. Uh, so ultimately we're left with, if we want the defenses out in the world actually protecting people, they've got to go into upstream. Uh, and then this will save the, the work of forward porting every release uh, and you get more review and more testing. Uh, ultimately.
So I'm going to take a, the first of a couple of digressions. Um, this is to illustrate the, the utility of defenses uh, living in kernel forks. Um, so this is uh, email SMTP session establishment uh, for people who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, the client connects, the server sends a banner, and it's a line at a time communication. They say hello, says who's this from, okay, here's some mail, great. Um, spam bots don't really care about this, so as soon as they connect, they just throw everything at once. And the server continues to process it a line at a time, saying, oh, I saw a line, okay, oh, I saw another line, okay, whatever. Um, this is really easy to block. As a server, you just pause briefly between your accept and your banner, and if you receive any text, they're in violation of the SMTP protocol, and you can drop the connection. Um, this is super easy, uh, very, very simple, um, but it's not the default. It's very effective because it's not the default. Uh, if everyone did this, i.e. if it were upstream, um, spammers would adapt because they'd see it everywhere. Uh, and to give you an idea of how effective this is, on my own uh, mail server, a couple weeks ago on a Monday, I looked and out of about 6,700 emails, uh, two thirds of them got rejected just due to the banner delay. And another 22% actually made it into processing and spam assassin rejected them and then a nice 12% remained that was actually delivered. Um, but I mean, I, I do have to admit though that having a, a, a mixed environment does have some benefits. Uh, but the point is that a defense may appear effective because it isn't widely examined. Um, it's not true everywhere. Some good defenses are, are good. Um, second digression is on, on Stack Clash, a uh, recent exploit. Um, this one is, this digression is about uh, showing the amount of work it can take to do upstreaming. There's been a lot of uh, folks in, in looking at adding stuff to the Linux kernel, they just say, hey, it's right there in the world, why don't we just take it into the upstream kernel? It's, it's real easy, right? It's already been written. <clears throat> um, so the, the stack clash problem in, in 2017, most of the underlying issues were, got pretty well understood in 2010, and Linux took some, some uh, action upstream to add this, this gap between stack and heap in, in, uh, in user space memory layouts. Um, Linux added this 4K gap, uh, and GR Security looked at this issue and thought, well, let's add a bunch of defenses around this. We're going to add a gap, um, but that's not enough. We want to also stop a set UID process from having a very large stack. So we'll limit the stack to eight, eight megabytes uh, on for set UID processes. Um, and this will stop memory layouts from being adjusted if you have a really large stack limit. Um, so they had effectively a four-line patch um, with this idea. Uh, and as we're dealing with stack clash and going through trying to get these defenses into upstream, um, I was pushing to add more of these defenses. Um, so this four-line fix, uh, this, this good idea and four lines as implemented in GR security, uh, which just landed, turned into a 15-patch series, got reviewed by you know at least seven other people, ended up making the kernel smaller, and more importantly, and the point of this, is it actually does what it says it was going to do. Um, what got missed in GR security was that they were doing the stack adjustment before all other threads got killed in a thread group. Uh, so for example, if you spun up a bunch of threads that were all setting their stack limit to, uh, to unlimited um, in, a, in a tight loop, and you had a, another thread start an exec, it would go through the code, they'd hit their patch, and it would say, oh, you're above eight megs, we'll set you to eight megs, and a couple lines of execution later, one of the other threads would reset it to unlimited, and you'd go through and it would just be instantly bypassed, and this was trivial um, to go around. You know, so you set your stack to unlimited, you've got some set UID program that reports its stack size, and you can run it normally, and it says, okay, eight megs, and then you just trivially race, and you get the unlimited stack again. Um, so this was unupstreamed and unexamined for seven years. Uh, the Stack Clash folks missed this detail too uh, in their analysis when they looked at, looked at GR security. Um, I would say upstream is just as to blame for not having this also, but um, the point is we've got to get things in upstream. Um, 
there's a lot of really good ideas and we need more review of those ideas and get them actually ported and working uh, correctly. So how do we solve all these problems? Uh, at the end of 2015, right after the Washington Post article, uh, I announced the Kernel Self-Protection Project where I asked interested people to come join me in, in doing this kind of work. Uh, I knew I could never hope to do it all on my own, um, so I was just, uh, I wanted at least, I could at least provide guidance and try to avoid the pitfalls of upstreaming and act as a shield for flames and do whatever, but I'm um, mostly just begging people to help me uh, work on this. Uh, the announcement is linked there. Um, we've got a wiki page with some things uh, listed. Um, and the, one of the things I wanted to focus on for the project, again, was the self-protection of the kernel itself. There's a ton of other work uh, that could be going on for user space to, to user space defense. Uh, you know, the kernel supported user space defenses. There's a lot of stuff. Um, and that's also going on at the same time, but I've mostly tried to focus uh, my own attention on just the kernel self-protection piece because it seems like it's the, m the least examined. Um, and right now, we've, these numbers are a little hard to count, but uh, there's like 12 organizations, 10 individuals, and a bunch, bunch of technologies, and I'm just looking at it as slow and steady. We're turtles slowly making our way across the desert. Um, I try to update this list of, of people and organizations uh, doing this. Some people uh, are, might not expect uh, to be listed here, uh, but they've certainly helped with some of these things. Um, if, you, uh, if I got your name wrong or if, you're, if you move to a new company, uh, let me know, I'll update this. Um, but I just want to give you an idea of, of, of how wide this actually became. Uh, we got a lot of people uh, helping, thankfully. Um, so before we get into the protections we've been working on, um, I think it's a good idea to, to classify the two basic categories that the protections fall into. Um, these slides are kind of filled with digressions. Uh, so one type of protection that ends up uh, in the kernel is probabilistic. Um, they depend on a secret that an attacker doesn't know. Uh, passwords are a good example of this. Uh, if someone can guess your password, you're, you're done. Um, the stack protector is another good example that a lot of people have seen and address, uh, address space layout randomization uh, where the, op the offset can be exposed to an attacker. Um, the other form is deterministic protections which are mostly about a state of the system that can't be bypassed. So if this is like an architectural defense like read-only memory where it's uh, you know, managed by the, the MMU or the, the CPU and chipset, um, or some aspect of how the code was designed. Like if you have bounds checking in every use of an array, that's effectively a deterministic protection. Um, so we move on to bug classes that we're trying to get rid of or that are cause uh, a lot of problems. Um, we've got stack buffer overflows and stack exhaustion. Um, these are two different things. I've sort of lumped them together here. Um, we've got mitigations that we already have in the kernel. Um, I've put those in bold because we actually have them. Um, there's guard pages to detect when we've exhausted uh, a stack and gone past the end of it. Um, uh, there was a version of this in, in GR security and uh, upstream has this now, uh, the VMAP stack. Uh, and as sort of an explo exploitation technique, but I listed it under the bug class, is uh, at the very uh, bottom of stack was thread info on a number of architectures and that had a number of sensitive fields in it. Uh, so if an attacker could uh, you know, fill up the stack, they could actually get to that value and write to it. Uh, so moving that off the stack uh, was another way to make us less vulnerable. Um, there's also alloc A checking with, or like dealing with uh, variable length arrays on the stack um, and uh, that's being worked on. The stuff in italics is sort of ongoing uh, in, in upstreaming efforts, uh, working on, on porting one of the uh, packs and GR security GCC plugins to, to do stack clearing on exits. And then there's stuff like shadow stacks. Uh, this exists in Clang, for example, has a safe, a safe stack implementation. Um, so getting that working uh, with, uh, with the kernel would be nice. Um, one comment on, on this, uh, stack canaries, the recent Bluetooth vulnerabilities, uh, the Blueborn attacks, uh, work against Linux kernel when you don't build the stack canary. Uh, 
it was trivially mitigated by having the stack canary active. Uh, but there are people building without the stack protector, and it blows my mind that this is a that this is an issue. So please, please turn on the stack protector in your kconfig. I'm going to try to uh, make that a, a default on option, uh, but it's a little funny because different compilers deal with it differently. Um, other classes, integer overflow, uh, this shows up in all kinds of different places. Um, one of them is in reference counting, so if you can overflow a reference counter back around and decrement it back to zero, it'll get freed while things are still using it. Um, uh, out of PAX was PAX ref count, which sort of checked for all atomic overflow, as not just ref counting. Um, and so we've had ongoing conversions to use a new type called ref count t instead of atomic t. Uh, I think we're probably on the fourth release of getting a lot of conversion patches in, something like 300 patches is what uh, Elena has been slowly uh, getting changed in the kernel. Um, and then there's, um, there's compiler instrumentation you can do to notice at runtime when you've overflowed uh, an integer multiplication. Uh, the version of this is the PAX size overflow and Clang has a version of this as well. Um, getting those into the kernel uh, could be quite interesting, especially um, Clang you can do on a uh, per build unit, like if you, if the 85% of vulnerabilities that are in vendor drivers, uh, you could just build the drivers tree with integer overflow protection and leave everything else in the core kernel alone. Um, that's another option for dealing with that. Um, and we've got just generic buffer overflows uh, in mem copy, string copy, all these different places, uh, copy to and from user. We've got a bunch of hardening there, uh, an additional attack surface reduction that's been going on. Um, doing metadata validation, like, you know, these types of things have, have existed in glibc for a long time, where if you're updating a linked list, actually verify that it's sane. Um, Fortify source has existed for quite some time uh, in user space builds, uh, and getting this into the kernel is, is interesting. It doesn't necessarily catch uh, a whole lot of, of really bad stuff, but it does keep us, uh, it avoids bugs and, and some minor leaks still. Um, a lot of the more serious stuff has already been caught, uh, but we can improve this further than what's already in, in upstream. Um, I always have to mention format string uh, injections. The worst of this was fixed in a while ago in 3.13, so the percent %n format, uh, spec uh, format thing uh, would let you turn a format string injection into a write primitive. So you could actually write memory using percent %n. Uh, so we work to just get rid of the kernel's entire use of percent %n and then drop it from the format specification. Uh, so that downgraded the entire class uh, of bug from you know, writable exploitation to just now information leaks. Uh, but we can actually improve the information leaks as well. Uh, there's been a lot of tricks uh, in Again, Fortify Source has done some things like that in user space, uh, and we can have the, we can actually have the compiler help us quite a bit in identifying places where you have a format string that is coming out of writable memory. Um, speaking of information leaks, uh, the the whole class of of issues where you're leaking kernel pointers either to data memory that you want to target as an attacker or the base of the kernel itself. Um, there's been some work on this. Uh, it's not as strong as I'd like. Um, we've, we've seen some work recently on percent %n. Greg tells me that someone might be picking this up again. Um, what? Okay. Anyway, well, that's coming. I should probably turn this into italics so that I could show that we're working on it again. Uh, there's an entire, another entire class of bugs is uninitialized variables. Um, I kind of like this one because uh, people have traditionally looked at uninitialized variables as information leaks only. Like, oh, well, we don't know what's in there, but you might be leaking uh, stuff. Uh, but you can end up in situations where your uninitialized variable is a function pointer. Uh, and, I, and if you can control what that function pointer is pointing to, suddenly you've got execution control. Uh, and that's one of the examples I did uh, because I was tired of people telling me that uninitialized variables being fixed was just info leak fixes and that's not very high priority. Uh, so I demonstrated actually getting uh, execute control using this. And I actually don't like the term uninitialized variables because it lets people think that they just don't know what's there. Of, of course the variable has been initialized, it's just that you don't know with what. So figuring out what it got initialized with uh, is, is the point. Um, 
There's a bunch of mitigations here. Uh, there's uh, clearing the stack on exit from, from a syscall. Uh, that's a, a plugin that, that uh, PAX and GR Security has, and that's been worked on by Alexander Popov. Uh, so we should have something like that in upstream soon. Um, recently, we landed for 4.14. Um, we expanded the, the PAX plugin for uh, struct leak so that ver stack variables being passed by reference to other functions, uh, GCC won't warn about those being used prior to being uh, initialized. Like if you actually try to use a variable before it's been initialized, GCC will say, oh, you're using an uninitialized variable. Um, but that's silent if you just pass it uh, with a pointer to some other function. It decides, oh, you know what you're doing. It's gone to another function. That functional must be updating it. You're totally cool. Um, so we can actually instrument the compiler to wipe any of these before, if they appear to not have been initialized, to uh, zero them before we pass them to a function. And this uh, should kill whole, whole classes of, of this problem, um, which I'm, is nice. Uh, and I'd like to see the performance impact of this. It doesn't look too bad. Oh, here, sorry. Get the microphone. I'm going to bounce this off a mirror. Can we make that? annotatable, so we have a lot of code where we pass in uninitialized something uh, with a pointer into a function, and the function actually does the initialization. Yeah, uh, we, so we I, could. I want to avoid the extra step of, right. oh, set it to zero first, and then uh, do it again. Do it again. <laughs> um, that doesn't exist right now. Uh, it certainly could be added. Um, I'd love to have people uh, look at that. Um, there are situations where we've had uh, fixes in the past to do this, to do zeroing beforehand before it's passed to some handler, uh, where maintainers have actually knacked it because they didn't want any amount of performance change at all. So an annotation in that regard would be weird because you'd basically be saying, well, we know we're not initializing it and we don't want to, so we'd want to mark it as as it's a different annotation where we'd want the plugin to still do it because then the person choosing to run the plugin can eat the performance cost. Um, so I think we'd need two annotations. Yeah. Um, that's an area of improvement for sure. Um, which gets us to uh, exploit methods. Um, so again, ex attackers need this, uh, as previously mentioned, for their, their chains of attack along with their bugs that they're using to, to get their foothold. Um, so this is related to the information leaks, but finding the kernel itself, uh, this tends to be an issue for ROP and for other uh, forms of attack. Uh, moving the kernel around helps a bit. Uh, it's pretty leaky still, um, but there's CPU vendors are aware of the, the problems here and we're getting some improvements, um, but doing kernel ASLR has been interesting. Um, there are some ideas about doing like complete reorganization of of the .o files at runtime, uh, that seems uh, expensive, <laughs> but it's one uh, improvement. Um, there's other th work on executable but not readable memory, so you couldn't read out portions of the kernel. Uh, I think that that would be, uh, it's interesting, the user space support has landed for those things in a couple architectures, uh, but I think um, tracing people might be upset with this, as you wouldn't be able to actually read out the kernel. Um, and then there's a uh, per build structure layout randomization, which is something uh, GR Security wrote a plugin to do. Uh, we have this in upstream now, so if you're uh, if you're kind of crazy enough to turn this on, um, it does obfuscate the targets an attacker wants wants to get at uh, when when trying to uh, perform their exploit, and that just rearranges structures that have been marked or automatically selected structures. Um, much like mentioning the stack protector, I have to leave this slide in here um, for direct kernel overwrite. Uh, we too recently had architectures, and we still have some architectures where this is a problem, uh, where as an attacker, if you got a write primitive, you could just literally change the code of the kernel itself in running memory. This is crazy. Um, another issue and why I have uh, x86 listed as 318, although this got solved much, much earlier in, in x86 was, this protection kept regressing. Like we'd do all the work to make sure things were read-only in, in the executable area and then sometime later someone would be like, oh, 
there's this whole memory segment that's writable and executable. That's bad. Uh, so now, uh, now there's code to actually at boot to walk the whole page table and make sure that things are not uh, writable and, and executable at the same time. Uh, so we don't have these regressions anymore. Hold on. Here it comes. Heads up. <laughs> We, we still need to flip that back and forth at runtime when we do things like changing static keys and uh, yeah, I mean, dynamic patching, that sort of stuff. I mean, as far as other, other uh, memory in the kernel? Yeah, I mean, the, the, we do dynamically patch the text even at yes. runtime. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but there, those are uh, narrow windows, um, but at rest, things are read only. And that's the main thing. How do you solve the problem of uh, large page alignment? Because we, we want to map the linear mapping with large pages. So we need to make sure text and RO data uh, and data are in, uh, in, um, in at least separate huge pages. Um, right. So that's basically on a per architecture basis. Uh, this was the large, that was mostly a concern on ARM where there was less traditionally less memory per system. Well, it's also for us because of 16 meg pages on the traditional PowerPC. Yeah, so, I mean, on ARM, it basically was a, uh, a config option where you say either I want to waste a whole bunch of memory um, by having them in separate large segments or I want to have you know, high memory pressure by uh, breaking it down into smaller memory pages. And you could go either way. Okay, so the problem we had for a long time is I think a lot of our bootloader only support a single loadable segment, so we have to create a gigantic image. Yeah, uh, we, it's fixable. It's just yeah, yeah, and, and um, my understanding is that uh, at least on ARM sixty four, I think, and probably x eighty six, it would sort of dynamically break up the large page into multiple small pages to do that to do that rewriting. Um, so you could add PowerPC to your list. We have it. Oh yeah. Okay. When was it added? I don't know. I just Nick just say Nick Pickin just telling me Balbir implemented it. So okay, I, I'm happy to add it. Um, I'd I'd like to know what version that was so I can add it to my list. Yeah. That'd be good. Um, come see me. <laughs> I'm gonna. Yes. So uh, here, you want to go through me? Or... Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there an any contradiction between having this kind of protection, but at the same time, uh, it's an option, but we can override some kernel function by having the kernel live patching. Yeah, uh, I mean, we can, so the kernel can override itself. Um, there's functions to, to do this already. Um, the, the issue is mostly like data at rest. Uh, as an attacker, if you build up a ROP chain that calls the kernel functions to rewrite the kernel, you can do that. But if you're at that point, you could just call whatever you wanted. Um, as, a, as the attacker, but the point was uh, to break the chain of having a single bug that allows a write anywhere to just write directly into the kernel. Um, so at rest, it should be not writable. And that's, that's what was missing, like uh, prior to 319, ARM, ARM memory was just read, write, execute for the entire, for the entire kernel text image was that way. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna keep going really quick. Um, much like kernel text overwrite, uh, function pointer overwrite is, is, a, is a problem. So trying to reduce the attacks uh, surface there uh, has been important. Um, PAX did a lot of this uh, with kern exec and their Consify plugin. Um, there's some issues with porting the larger pieces of that uh, into upstream. Uh, I think that's probably the next major thing to really pay attention to. Uh, we did a tiny piece of this, which was read only after init, where if you've got memory that you during the init section, you need to choose some configuration options or make some subtle changes and then it's never changed again for the life of the system, there wasn't a good reason to leave that writable. Uh, so that got added uh, at least to, to change the attack surface there. Um, finally, there's user space execution. This is used by virtually all of the examples I've listed uh, so far in the slides, which is once an attacker gets execution control, they just tell the kernel to jump into user space memory and run their attack. Um, because they have, as an attacker, you have much more control over there because in the kernel you don't have a writable and executable memory, or you shouldn't. Um, this is being solved with various uh, hardware things. I shouldn't call this segmentation. Um, 
and emulation of this uh, has existed uh, for quite some time. Uh, Pax did a bunch of this. Um, you can do a number of different ways. ARM uh, landed this emulation for this if the hardware feature doesn't exist in, in 4.3. Uh, ARM64 landed this in 4.10. Um, Andy Ludomirsky has been working on this for x86, but it had a lot of prerequisite changes, uh, TLB flushing and some other stuff. Um, and then a, another crazy version of this is to add compiler instrumentation to before every function call to set the high bit um, on, on your uh, function, whatever your function is that you're about to call, you know, your function pointer. Um, that would force you, if it was a user space address, it would force you into the, the void in, in, uh, in the VA space. Uh, there is some performance hit there. Um, similar to user space execution is user space data. So if you aim, if a corrupted linked list aims off into user space memory, an attacker can build up more linked list or a structure or whatever. Um, this is solved in a similar way. It's slightly different hardware uh, uh, method, but uh, the, the emulation is the same. Um, there's some work being done uh, on exclusive page frame ownership uh, because the, on the larger architectures, you have a complete map of the physical memory uh, in kernel space. So as an attacker, if you can figure out where their physical memory is for user space, you could just have the kernel jump into the kernel memory that represents the user space memory. Uh, so you basically you have to unmap those pages out of the kernel memory if they're being mapped to user space. Uh, finally, I've talked a little bit about ROP already, but reuse code chunks. Um, that's uh, sort of the next step in, in defense here as we make it harder and harder to do direct, uh, direct attacks in the kernel. Um, there's been a lot of research on control flow integrity. Uh, there's the Clang CFI. Uh, there are some improvements to the Clang CFI called a K CFI for kernel CFI. Uh, those, that code isn't public yet, but I, I keep asking the, the author to publish it. Um, and then PAX has their uh, a GCC plugin to do similar work uh, in RAP. Um, so there's a lot of research happening here, and getting this into upstream would be good. Um, I'm going to skip all the things that we did in recent kernels. You can go read about them. Um, challenges, there's a lot of conservatism in the upstream kernel uh, maintainership. Uh, it took 16 years to accept symlink restrictions. Um, I was the idiot who tried the last time and spent two years before uh, it got in, uh, but multiple people tried throughout the years. Um, getting upstream to accept the responsibility of taking these things and trying to fix the ecosystem, uh, accepting the technical burden, and uh, for people who are out of tree, sort of having the patience to understand how the upstream development process works. Uh, we have obvious technical challenges. Um, I'm just going to go quickly. Uh, and resources, getting people to do this, develop, test, and document it. Um, anyway, I'm out of time. So those are ways to reach me. It's a copy of the slides are there. Um, and if you want to uh, see what we're up to, join our mailing list or uh, read the wiki. Um, are there any quick questions? Uh, where, is, where is the microphone? Oh, there you go. Oh, got one back there. Mind if I have it? Okay. Um, just a quick question. I mean, why isn't that a default? I mean, okay, some people will take a performance hit, but these people are most likely recompiling their own kernels. So, I mean, you today, you spoke about security. Greg yesterday said, uh, I, mean, I mean, you also talk about hardening the kernel, getting up-to-date kernels. Most of this could be the default. I mean, on your wiki page, I mean, you have a wiki page with all the config you can yep. put on to harden your kernel, and yet it's not a default yet. So um, it goes to a couple things I talked about. Um, one of those is the conservatism uh, with defaults. Uh, the traditional path for a lot of these things actually is for them to get added to the kernel default off um, to make a config option, and then over the next span of time, whatever that span of time is, uh, all of the distros and everyone building kernels in the world turns it on. And then at some point, people in upstream go, why the hell is this off by default? And you turn it on. Uh, but doing that too early really, really freaks people out. Um, so there's just this waiting time where we have to accept that. Um, I'd really like to see that change. But I, don't f I haven't felt that that was a battle worth fighting um, since the trajectory for most of these things is that they get turned on by default. Uh, I just want to have those features available so that when people do care about having those defenses, they actually have them available. They have to remember to turn them on, which is not great, uh, but they can turn them on. Um, and then we'll get to a point where we can just make them on by default. 
Regarding the, the defaults, uh, I think that one of the biggest difficulties uh, is to make this tunable at runtime because many of such options uh, are only uh, uh, config options at yeah. build time and uh, many of these features will uh, significantly impact performance for right. certain use case. And if you use a regular distro for whatever, it can be to run a web browser, to run a firewall, a proxy, or whatever, yeah. you are not uh, sensitive to the same type of uh, workload. And that's the biggest problem, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I think that was one of the considerations I had with a lot of things that went in. Like uh, when kernel ASLR originally went in, there were some build time blockages against hibernation and some other stuff. So trying to improve that so it wasn't a build time choice, it was a runtime choice. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, some things are like architectural things like compiler instrumentation. Uh, it's hard to make that runtime. Uh, but yeah, that's absolutely a consideration for a lot of this. Um, I think there was another question. I, have you tried uh, uh, converting some part of the kernel to different memory safe language like Rust, for example? Um, there were some experiments of people trying to do drivers in Rust, um, making a sort of a the, the interface layer between the kernel and Rust. Uh, you end up with really big mod modules, um, but it does work. Um, performance is not terrible. Um, so there have been some experiments, but nothing is really stuck. Um, I'd kind of like to see that. Uh, I think it would be interesting, at least, to, to do more experiments and try to do uh, less trivial drivers. Um, you know, you start getting into things like, oh, how do we deal with DMA in Rust? Like, okay. Um, so getting that interface layer, I think, uh, needs some attention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can you have one I, I can try. I left it out a bunch. <laughs> Uh, there's something else I would like to add. Uh, sometimes people think that uh, security people are a bit of extremists and want to uh, uh, turn off everything. Sometimes it's true. Um, but I keep thinking that in practice what is important is just to raise the bar. And on yep. many systems, uh, what we need to do, in fact, is to make the kernel as hard to crack as it is to brute force the root password. Right. So yeah. th that's mostly the, the principle. Yeah, was, uh, your machine is insecure. This is my, mm. my paranoia level. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I would love that. Um, I'm a crazy security guy, so. Uh, the, with the conservative end, with the, I mean, there's a lot of other considerations, like performance can be an issue. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree, it's a good goal. Um, well, that's it. Uh, thank you.